Seven days after the last plenary sitting, senators reconvened into a chamber arranged in compliance with all the precautions of the moment. The first motion on the order paper was a call for precautionary measure in the telecommunication sector. The 5G network engulfed by speculations and uncertainties came under legislative focus. A motion by Senator Uche Ekunife called for an investigation. The motion is on the status of fifth generation network in Nigeria. The Senate notes with growing concern the ongoing discussion about the current status of the fifth generation network in Nigeria, especially with regards to whether or not Nigeria is presently connected to the 5G network. The Senate notes further the concern by scientists and medical experts that the emissions from the 5G towers could adversely affect the health of citizens by causing symptoms like damage to eyes, antibiotic resistance, and other physiological effects on the nervous and immune system. The Senate is mindful of the recurrent health hazards, which are usually associated with technological advancements, such as the 5G network, and the need to conduct a thorough test prior to the deployment of the new technology. The Senate is aware of a statement by Dr. Issa Patani, Honorable Minister of Communication, in October 2019, during the 39th Gulf Information Technology Exhibition in Dubai, that Nigeria was ready to deploy 5G network across the country to ease network flow. The Senate is aware also that in subsequent interviews, the Honorable Minister of Communication indicted that no license has yet been issued by the federal government of Nigeria for the operation of 5G network, except for a three-month study trial granted to MTN, which commenced on the 25th of November 2019, and intended to critically review and study the health and security implications of deploying 5G in Nigeria. The Senate acknowledges that 5G reportedly holds a lot of promise for mobile broadband services because of its faster speed and better capacity. The Senate further acknowledges that there is neither a conclusive proof nor has it been universally established that the deployment of 5G network is either harmful to the human body or is in any way linked to the global pandemic of COVID-19. A lot of countries like South Korea, United Kingdom, and Germany have successfully deployed and are using the 5G network. The Senate is concerned that uncertainty surrounding whether or not the 5G network has been launched in Nigeria will continue to fuel the speculations and rumors concerning the deployment of 5G network and its effect on the citizens of Nigeria. The Senate is further concerned about the massive infrastructural upgrade as has never been seen before, which will follow the launching of 5G network in Nigeria. For instance, for the deployment of 5G network in urban areas, the providers have to install a strong radiating mobile communications antenna approximately every 100 meters, producing what has been described as the radiant tsunami. Uh, sorry, radiation tsunami, and taking up to a 1,000-fold increase in the transmission power. The Senate is informed that several countries, including Switzerland, one of the world's leaders in the rollout of 5G mobile technology, has placed an indefinite moratorium on the use of 5G network because of health concerns. The Senate is desirous of investigating the true status of 5G network in Nigeria, to ensure that Nigerian citizens are not exposed to an unreasonable risk of great body injury or harm. The Senate accordingly resolves to direct the com Committees on Communication, Science and Technology, and ICT and Cyber crime, Crimes to conduct a thorough investigation to determine the status of 5G network in Nigeria and its technological impact on Nigerian citizens. I report back to the Senate within two weeks.
Mr. President, distinguished colleagues, I so move. I think the motion itself is very explicit. This is a very controversial issue that has attracted global attention. And I think at this point, we need experts to look into the issue of the 5G technology. In view of this, Mr. President, I don't think we need to overlabor ourselves in discussing or debating this motion. I think we just go straight to the prayer and approve what uh, the mover has suggested. Thank you, Mr. President. I am convinced, like a lot of Nigerians, that it would be irresponsible of any government to implement or subscribe to the implementation of a highly sensitive technological, I mean, uh, advancement like the fifth generation network without such a government being able to convince itself on behalf of its citizens that that is not a dangerous move to make. I say for the record, and I stand to be contradicted, that neither our Federal Ministry of Communication nor the regulatory agency, National Com Nigerian Communication Commission, can say to Nigerians that any scientific step whatsoever has been taken and that whatever conclusion they had drawn, including their announcement to Nigerians that Nigeria was ready for the deployment of the 5G technology, was based on any form of scientific understanding. Nothing has been done. In my interest, our colleagues to know that most insurance companies all over Europe, including the United Kingdom, in the last few, few months, amended their clauses to reflect non-inclusion of a category of diseases which, according to them, are caused by, I mean, certain radiation-induced technology, including it's on record, Mr. President, the fifth generation network. The world is concerned. A group of 240 scientists in Europe concluded their research and approached the European Union Commission, I mean, expressing their dissatisfaction over the manner in which the fifth generation technology was being implemented. And all the European Union told them was that it would be the responsibility of each country to investigate and take an independent position as to whether or not they would encourage the deployment of fifth generation technology in their country. So each country is doing it in Europe. Here we are in Nigeria. Mr. President, I can go on and on on this issue, but I know time is of the essence, and our other colleagues will also want to speak. But let me make it clear that I'm totally in support of this motion, except that I believe we we'll need more than two weeks to investigate this issue and conclude, which is a matter for amendment when it comes to that, to the prayer. But we must provide Nigerians a platform to bring experts together to investigate this matter. And the Nigerian government, through NCC or Federal Ministry of Communication, should not rush you know, into implementing the fifth generation technology in Nigeria until at least we have some scientific basis upon which we want to proceed. I think the prayer is, uh, is very straightforward. There is no point to debate thing that we have no information, no idea. So I think the prayer is, uh, is enough. So I'll put the question, unless, is there anybody against the motion? Okay, so I'll put the, the, the question. 
The Senate accordingly resolves to direct the committees on ICT and cyber crimes to conduct a thorough investigation to determine the status of 5G network in Nigeria and its technological impact on Nigerian citizens and report back to the Senate within two weeks. Amendment. Amendment, uh, Senator Samuel. My amendment is that the Committee on Public Health be included in the committee because this concerns health. Yeah. Uh, that's my amendment. Sir. Yeah. Any second? I rise to second the motion, uh, the amendment as moved by Senator Samuel. I so second. Those in favor of the prayer as amended, say aye. Those against any, the ayes have the National Health Emergency Bill 2020, sponsored by Senator Chukuka Otazi, passed first reading as another motion on investigation came from Senator George Sekibo on alleged misappropriation of 40 billion naira in the Niger Delta Development Commission and the alleged arbitrary sacking of its management staff. The first business of the day is the presentation of a bill standing in the name of distinguished Senator Chukuka Otazi on the National Health Emergency Bill 2020. Mr. President, you may wish to invite the clerk of the Senate to read the short title of the bill. Clerk of the Senate. Mr. President, distinguished senators, National Health Emergency Best Reading. National Health Emergency Bill 2020, SB 413, first reading taken. As a senator of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, and I believe the same thing applies to the rest of our colleagues. I'm entitled to know possibly the details of any bill being presented in this Senate through the distribution of the Gazette. This bill has all been read now. I would like to know the details and possibly receive a Gazette copy. And I'm sure those of my colleagues who would like to see the bill will also want to have copies as well. Recall that we have a controversial bill in the House of Reps that has to do with the quarantine. Uh, act amendment. So I want to ensure that we don't go the same route that's happening in the House of Reps. So I'd like to know the details, probably a summary of what this bill is all about, or possibly get a copy of the gazetted uh, uh, form of this particular bill, so that I'll be sure of what it's all about. They enable me to prepare my response, or possibly my contributions to this bill when it comes up for second reading. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Ike. The clerk, Please ensure that the, okay, they are distributing now so you can have a copy. And let me also say that we are not taking second reading today. You have uh, at least one week to read and uh, prepare uh, for, for the second reading. I th I, everybody should have a copy, please. Thank you very much. Mr. President, my highly respected and distinguished colleagues, the sixth order of the day is a motion standing in the name of distinguished Senator George Sekibo on the urgent need to investigate alleged financial recklessness in the Niger Delta Development Commission. Mr. President, you may wish to invite distinguished Senator George Sekibo to move the motion. Mr. President, thank you for inviting me and giving me the privilege to move the motion on the urgent need to investigate alleged financial recklessness in the Niger Delta Development Commission. Mr. President, the Senate is aware that the Niger Delta Development Commission was established following the enactment of the Commission's Establishment Act No. 6, 2000, Laws of the Federation of Nigeria, as a federal government response to the long-term agitation of the people of the Niger Delta region. The Senate is aware further that the people of the Niger Delta region has clamored against the backwardness and underdevelopment of their region the environmental devastation of the area occasioned by the oil and gas exploitation and exploration activities, as well as the production of same in the area for over 60 years going. 
The Senate notes that the federal government established the commission in response to the quest of the people of the region to fast track development in the area and ameliorate the devastation done to the environment. Note also that the act establishing the commission as among other functions giving the commission the following mandate in part two, section seven, subsection one and two as follows. To formulate policies and guidelines for the development of the Niger Delta area, conceive, plan, and implement in accordance with set rules and regulations, project and programs for the sustainable development for the Niger Delta area in the field of transportation, including roads, jetties, waterways, health, education, employment, industrialization, agriculture and fisheries, housing and urban development, water supply, electricity and telecommunications, etc., etc. The Senate is worried that the accelerated development envisaged by the NDDC Establishment Act has not actually impacted on the region. 20 years after its establishment, as the operators of the Commission's policies and programs are neither focused or have completely abandoned the initial desire of the people of the area and use the Commission's funds on programs and policies that do not commensurate with the funds so far transmitted to it by the federal government and other donors. The Senate is worried further that there has been loud acquisition of misuse of funds by previous management of the Commission, which portrayed the Commission as a financial conduit pipe, especially when the aspiration of the founding fathers have been forsaken. The Senate believes that visible financial recklessness may have prompted the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to set up an interim management committee, IMC, while ordering a forensic audit of the Commission so as to reposition it for its intended mandate. The Senate believes that while the President's action of setting up an IMC and the forensic edit may have been conceived to forestall the financial recklessness of the Commission and reposition it for fast tracking for the development of the region, the IMC has been more bedeviled with the same financial misuse, misappropriation, misapplication, sorry, or outright fraud in the management of the funds of the Commission. Snake is alarmed that the IMC has inundated itself with undue gross misconduct in the fraudulent contract award without recourse to due processes and flagrant disobedience to the provisions of Section 19, 25, 41, 42 of the Public Procurement Act 2007. Worry that within the last three months, the Commission has spent over 40 billion naira of the Commission's fund without recourse to establish process of funds disbursement, which has opened up further suspicion among stakeholders of the Niger Delta region. Worried further of the IMC's arbitrary use of executive power in alleged wrongful sacking of management staff of the Commission without recourse to establish civil service rules and practice with the aim of concealing the fraudulent financial recklessness they have committed. It's no understand that many of the management staff sacked, if not all, still last many years to, to retirement based on the civil service rules, order and precedence. The Senate observed that the IMC has lost credibility and seen as a financial conduit part based on opinions of stakeholders in the region. This therefore urgently calls for 
an intervention by the Senate or the Federal Republic of Nigeria to instill confidence in the people for whom the commission was primarily established. Note that the provision of Section 88 of the 1999 Constitution as amended has conferred on the National Assembly the Senate in particular that have been appropriating funds to the Commission the power to ascertain whether the sum of 40 billion naira so appropriated and the coffers of the Commission has been properly applied to programs with records to establish processes and procedures as contained in the Commission's mandate. The Senate agrees that the Senate can invoke Section 89 of the 1999 Constitution as amended, which has given it an irrevocable mandate to carry out investigation on any department of government to which it appropriates funds, especially with the aim of exposing corruption, inefficiency or waste in the management of such public funds. The Senate accordingly resolved to, one, Mandate is Committee on Niger Delta Affairs to carry out an holistic investigation on all issues relating to, but not limited to, the alleged misapplication and misappropriation of the sum of 40 billion naira by the Commission, as well as all procurement and financial transactions of the Commission in this fiscal year 2020, and any other matter that is not in accordance with the provision of the NDC Establishment Act 2000 or any other extant law. Two, mandate is committee on the Delta Affair to investigate the appropriateness of the alleged arbitrary sack of the management staff of the Commission. And three, direct this committee to report its finding to the Senate in three weeks. Mr. Senior President, I so move. Issues of rest should be alleged, alleged, alleged. Because we are calling for investigation rather than speaking of the finality. Uh, I think the, the motion should, should, should rather indicate alleged. Otherwise, there will be no need for any investigation if we, we have confirmed. So I think we need to be properly guided. Senator Sirajuddin Ajibala. I'm raising the constitutional point of order based on section 36 of the 1999 constitution. The provision said that uh, in the determination of civil rights and obligation of a citizen, a person is entitled to fair hearing within a reasonable time. Looking at the tenor of this uh, motion on its face value as it is, it has made certain far reaching determination and conclusion, even without right to fair hearing being granted in that regard. Specifically, I refer to the last four paragraphs on page 469. One, part of it is that, worried that within the last three months, the commission has spent over 40 billion naira of the commission's fund without recourse, no alleged. No, the question is this, as it is now, if this Senate is taking this motion as drafted, the Senate is a Senate of record. This will be part of the record. I will say that. They made some observations, and that was to guide, and I said that should guide the Senate. Because all those things he said are supposed to be allegations. They cannot be said with finality. Otherwise, there will be no need for investigations. And that will deny the other side the fair hearing principle. So I agree with you, but we have already made the observation that this Senate should be guided. These are allegations. They are not yet confirmed. Mr. President, I watch television day in, day out, and all you listen to are people being sacked from the management of the Niger Delta. I watch it and so-so amount of money being expended. And the question I've always asked is whether these monies are followed due pro, uh, process. Now, the allegations on ground in the motion here that heavy amount of money has been expended 
by the interim management committee, and these monies are not, the, the expenditure has not followed due process. Mr. President, there is the absolute need, and I think the prayer speaks for themselves. Let us mandate the appropriate committee, which is the Niger Data Committee, to comprehensively investigate all of these allegations and report back to the Senate. So, Mr. President, I strongly support that the Niger Data Committee should engage in a comprehensive investigation of the Interim Management Committee as to ascertain whether these allegations are true or not. And if the allegations are true, appropriate sanctions should be meted out on the Interim Management Committee. Mr. President, I so support. I am a bit in difficulty to really situate myself about the contents of this motion. But I think I'm encouraged by my brother and friend, Bashiru, who raised the provision of Section 36 of the Constitution. I don't have the Constitution here, but I'm sure my memory will not fail me. That provision says, and I quote, in the determination of his civil rights and obligation, he shall be entitled to fair hearing by a court or tribunal constituted in such a manner as to secure its independence and impartiality. Those who are reading the Constitution, I'm sure my memory has not failed you. Now, as a Senate, we already have a committee, the Niger Delta uh, uh, Committee, whose responsibility is to ensure that in its oversight function, the money we have appropriated to Niger Delta Development Commission is appropriately utilized or spent. In this case, sir, we have not received any report from that committee to date indicating that something of this magnitude has happened in the Niger Delta uh, Commission. Now, the consequence of that is this, sir. In view of the fact that we have not received any report from this committee, in view of the fact that the Senate has mandated this committee to be its eye as far as this, the money appropriated to that commission is concerned, they become incapacitated to have our mandate to investigate this matter. And what that means is that while the motion stays valid, it may be nice and appropriate and in accordance with the provision of our country. Good afternoon and welcome to Panorama, live from Medjugorje Network Center. As the nation grapples with the effect of COVID-19 on the increase, efforts are being intensified by the federal and state governments to increase capacities of isolation centers for anticipated rise in cases. The expansion of isolation centers will prove useful as plans are underway to increase testing centers for speedy clearance of awaiting cases and more testing in affected communities. These strategies for containment of COVID-19 cannot completely succeed without support of communities to curb the spread through observing safety protocols. This is our focus today on Panorama. I am Muhammad Ibrahim. Last night, the National Center for Disease Control, NCDC, has confirmed 148 new cases of COVID-19 in Nigeria, bringing the total to 2,950. 98 deaths were recorded, while 481 cases were treated and discharged. A breakdown of the number of new cases indicates 43 from Lagos, Kano 32, Zamfara 40, Abuja 10, Katsina 9, and 7 from Taraba. Borno and Ogun states had six cases each, Oyo five, Edo, Kaduna and Bochi three each, Gombe and Adama one each, while Plateau, Sokoto and Kebi had one each. The House of Representatives during plenary on Tuesday engaged the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 in its bid to get details of current state of affairs of federal government's efforts to contain the ravaging coronavirus disease and the health crisis in Kano. 
National Assembly correspondent Lamy Ali reports that ministers of information, health, education, foreign affairs, aviation, interior, DG, NCDC, national coordinator and chairman of the presidential task force took up more than four hours in this session with the lawmakers. The federal government's team in the forefront of the fight against coronavirus fielded questions from House members on the emergency response to the pandemic covering areas such as management of infected persons, number and state of isolation centers, capacity of testing, issue of logistics among others, and efforts to mitigate its impact on economic and social activities. This present crisis has laid bare the fundamental weaknesses in our system of law and policy and left our nation at risk of devastating outcomes on all sides. What is the standard of ventilators per capita that every nation is supposed to have? How far inwards are we looking with regards to indigenous treatments? Chairman of the PTF, Boss Mustafa, outlined measures put in place by the federal government in the short and long term to effectively tackle the pandemic on all fronts and called for a legislative framework in that direction. For reforming and transforming our healthcare systems, strengthen the legislative framework for economic growth through domestic manufacturing. The presidential task force is working in collaboration with other structures set up by the president to ensure that there's a well-rounded national response. Our experts are participating in the investigation of the unexplained deaths in Kano, and the team shall be reinforced according to needs. In the absence of any vaccine or drugs for the treatment of COVID-19, the only option right now is what we call the non pharmaceutical intervention, NPI, which is anchored on the use of advocacy and public enlightenment to empower the citizens to protect themselves. In another development, the House has passed a resolution to institute legal action on allegations that it received financial inducement of $10 million from a foreign concern to influence the passage of the Infectious Diseases Control Bill as raised by the Deputy Speaker, Idris Wasi. This is to stay People who will think they will just go to the corridor of uh, the press and make a sports statement against Nigerians. We have our integrity. Both uh, some APC members and some members of opposition came up to say, look, let us don't consider this. It was not on the basis of whether anybody was given any money. This house must take a drastic action to protect the integrity of the leadership whose integrity has now been fingered and by extension, the integrity of this institution has been put at stake. An ad hoc committee has also been set up to investigate the matter. House Speaker Femi Bajabiamila says the bill will be subjected to public hearing, adding that it was conceived in the best interest of Nigerians. In the meantime, the House has resolved to investigate the Niger Delta Development Commission on alleged misapplication and misappropriation of funds. A letter from President Muhammadu Buhari requesting the approval of House members for the sourcing of 850 billion naira loan from domestic capital markets to finance critical projects in the 2020 appropriation bill was read at plenary from the National Assembly, Lami Ali, NC News. The alarming rise in number of cases of, of coronavirus pandemic in Borno barely two weeks since the first confirmed case was recorded. Borno Health Workforce COVID-19 response team has donated preventive kits to Borno state government aimed at assisting containment of the spread of the dread virus in the state. Yagum Subukar has details. Borno Health Workforce COVID-19 response team is an umbrella body comprising members from the National Association of Nigerian Nurses and Midwives Nigerian Medical Association, as well as Medical and Health Workers Union of Nigeria, working as a team to assist government in the fight against coronavirus pandemic in Borno. In view of this, the response team deemed it necessary to contribute their quota by donating some preventive kits to Borno state government, where the Commissioner for Women Affairs, Zue Regambu, on behalf of the state government, appreciated the gesture, saying the items would no doubt assist in prevention of COVID-19. 
for them to also dip hand in their pocket at this season of lockdown to donate items for the protection of uh, the personnel. It's amazing. Chairman, Borno Health Workforce COVID-19 Response Team, Professor Aliu Mohamed Kodia, while highlighting the challenges faced health workers in the front line fighting an invisible enemy said, 20 health personnel are already in isolation, having been tested positive of the virus, hence the need for government to look into plight of reviewing their risk allowances. Let me at this point call for more coordination among the different arms and the pillars of the subcommittee so that we get to where we hope we will go. Similarly, members of Borno Health Workforce COVID-19 response team had, while sympathizing with families of the 20 infected health workers, supported them with some relief items aimed to cushion their hardship while their breadwinners undergo treatment. In Medjugorje, Yagum Subukar, NTA News. As long as people do not accept the reality of the ravaging coronavirus pandemic and imbibe safety protocols to protect themselves and others, it will be difficult to contain the spread of the disease. This formed part of message on curbing community spread of COVID-19 by the Network for Civil Societies in Borno, supporting the war against the global health challenge. Let's join Paul Nkujevana for the report. Coronavirus pandemic is a health issue affecting human societies, requiring all hands on deck to stop it in its tracks. The civil society organization in Borno State that has been in the front of promoting peace and humanitarian activities in the post-insurgency recovery is now engaged in the COVID-19 containment. With me is the chairman of the civil society organization in Borno State, Ambassador Ahmed Shehu. Sir, as a representative of all segments of the society, what is the civil society organization role or engagement in supporting the containment of coronavirus pandemic in the states? The issue of the virus is all about the community. So we thought about what we call the civil society situation room. And the essence of the civil society situation room, the objective is to ensure that we bring the voice of the people into the situation. And we also provide the opportunity to the people in order that when there is a situation in the community, they can reach out to us. And we have received over 300 calls and we have referred about 17 cases. So we are at the, uh, at the top of the situation. We are feeding information, we are getting, getting information from the community members. When there are sick persons from the community, they tell us and now we link them with the rapid response squad of the government. So based on your assessment, are people really following the protocols of social distancing, hygiene practices and other measures put in place by Bono State government to contain this pandemic? Yeah, uh, the the level of sensitization we did in the communities has really helped. It's difficult for you to have 100% compliance. So right now what we are working on is toward ensuring that we sensitize the people to accept. Because you have some elite that are well educated up to now denying that this issue does not exist. It exists. The only thing we can urge people to do that is to, di to discipline themselves, to make sacrifice, to stay at home, to exercise the social distance as we said, and to ensure that we exercise almost sense of hygiene so that to ensure that it's not about protecting ourselves but protecting the larger humanity. Community, no doubt, has essential role in supporting government and health workers in preventing COVID-19 holding sway. Let's recognize the reality on ground. Follow laid down rules for your safety and others. It's back to studio with Mohammed Ibrahim. Thank you, Pauline. While efforts are being stepped up to contain spread of COVID-19, confirmed cases continue to rise in Borno and other parts of the country, putting pressure on isolation and treatment centers and further exposing health workers to risk of contracting the coronavirus pandemic. Curbing community spread remains a major strategy in containment through a robust and efficient contact tracing and speedy testing of suspected cases, especially with the anticipated move by state governments to provide testing facilities to complement existing NCDC laboratories. With me to discuss the situation at hand in Borno and efforts to scale up testing, isolation and treatment is the Borno State Commissioner of Health, Dr. Salu Ailu Kwayabura. You're welcome to Panorama. My pleasure. Thank you for having me this afternoon. Uh, let's start by asking, where are we in terms of uh, provision of additional testing facilities to speed up getting COVID-19 off the streets, which is a major step in containment? 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, you may recall that uh, about two weeks ago, precisely, the NCDC activated the molecular laboratory here in uh, the University of Medical Education Hospital to scale up the testing for COVID-19. Uh, that facility has been on board and has been doing its best to reach out to uh, the rising number of cases and they need to do more tests. However, the State Ministry of Health and the High Power Committee on uh, COVID-19 in Borno State uh, has seen the need to further upscale this. So in line with that, uh, we are looking at uh, setting up a molecular lab at the Morushio Ultramodern Hospital. Uh, work has already gone far because we have part of uh, the safety measures that are there uh, and the equipment, particularly the real-time uh, PCR machine, the automated uh, gene extraction equipment as well as the test kits have been ordered for already and the remodeling of the center is ongoing and has reached more than 65% as at the last time I saw yesterday. Uh, let me at this juncture say that it is only a laboratory where samples will be received from individuals and suspected cases mm -hmm. from far across the state and beyond the state and brought in there. I need to make this very important clarification because already we hear people talking about uh, Umaru Show Ultra Modern Hospital being turned into a Corona Hospital. That is absolutely not true. Okay. The hospital will continue to provide services that he has continued to do in the past. It's okay. only a laboratory that will be situated in there to help in this whole fight. Okay, then what is the current situation in Borno regarding uh, contact tracing and testing of suspected cases, both within the state capital and local governments where COVID-19 cases were confirmed? Uh, as you have uh, said in the beginning, Borno State now has about 106 uh, confirmed cases of COVID-19. Uh, of these 106, uh, we lost about 14. Uh, the, I mean, two have been discharged from the facility. The rest are doing very well, and I think in a couple of days we'll also discharge those ones. However, may I clearly say that uh, of this total number, uh, we've been able to identify a total of three uh, or four now from uh, Dikwa, okay. a total of three from Goza local government, particularly in Pulka specifically. We've also been able to identify two from Dambua, one from Bayou, uh, two I mean, five from Bu, mm -hmm. and then the rest are here in MMC Jerry. Now, what we have done in terms of contact tracing and scaling up services is that uh, from the inception, when we had uh, very few cases, we worked hard to ensure that every local government area has a rapid response team, which is composed mm -hmm. of about five individuals, including the local government disease surveillance officer, supported by the WHO, uh, the primary health care coordinator, and others. These are the people that go out to do contact tracing and surveillance for each of the local government areas. They work hand in hand with the local government uh, COVID-19 committees. Now, because of the rising cases and the need to refocus in some of these areas, we've had to increase the number of surveillance teams, particularly in the local government area and mm -hmm. Meduguri Jerry. As we speak, MMC Jerry now have a total of 25 rapid response teams that go out every day, whereas 20 are on disease surveillance, uh, five are actually out there on contact tracing and responding to alerts. Yeah. Uh, we're also reviewing the situation to see what we're going to do to increase the number further. But very importantly for us to be able to ease the kind of work we do, we've also been able to profile this and put them on a map so that we're able to, uh, word by word, tell the total number of cases in the world. As it is, the highest number of patients are actually coming from Mesandari Ward mm. in the MMC and also around Gozari Ward in Jerry. Mm. Uh, and we have sent out uh, more detailed tracking uh, mechanisms using the ODK phone so that we have a real-time uh, situation and report in those people. Uh, additionally, our teams not only go out now to do contact tracing, but they also go out to educate the people in conjunction with the blamas in the area mm. to get the people to understand the need for social distancing, for the use of masks, and hand washing amongst others mm -hmm. and they go further to make sure that in all the households visited and the area is visited the government has produced over 100,000 face masks of cloth type and are being distributed to the people by, by the contact tracing and a special team including our collaboration with the civil society organizations and this are being distributed so this is part of what we are doing in terms of contact tracing and making sure that we reach out to every 
every individual that is probably at risk or suspected to have COVID-19 disease in Borno State. Interesting. What are efforts in place to expand or provide more isolation facilities across the state and do you have a timeline? Uh, well, yeah, you may recall that the State Isolation Center is actually a 100 bedded facility augmented by the 36 bedded facility in the University of Medical Teaching Hospital. Now that we've reached the 100 mark and beyond, mm. uh, it's pertinent that we begin to have more isolation centers. Okay. The COVID-19 committee had worked proactively to look at possible sites for the uh, establishment of these isolation centers. One is already uh, in place and has reached advanced stage. That is uh, the uh, designated NYC orientation camp. The new NYC operation um, orientation camp on Baga Road at the four okay. Biwak uh, Motors. Uh, the equipment and beddings are already put in place. And uh, we round you know, and we hope that in the next one week at most, mm -hmm. that place will be ready to begin to receive patients. Also, uh, We've looked at expanding the isolation centers and decentralizing away from uh, Medic Rijiri. And uh, I'm glad to report that through community efforts, the people of Biu, uh, Town and Biu local government generally have come up to construct a 30 bedded isolation center uh, within Biu. It's now which a roofing stage, and we believe that in the next one week that mm -hmm. one will also be ready. A complement of equipment that are already available in these stores have been deployed to support that facility. All right, good. Uh, then lastly, what is the state of those undergoing treatment, including health workers infected in the line of duty, as we are yet to have any discharge out of the over 100 cases recorded? Uh, well, thank you. I think there's been a lag in terms of update, but I must say that uh, first and foremost, I done my heart and I threw a very big salute on behalf of the committee mm. and the government of Borno State, particularly frontline health workers who have gotten infected. I want them to know that uh, our heart goes out to them. They have our warm thoughts and we have them in our mind. And we believe that our prayers will see them through and they're helping to build resilience. Uh, going further, may I state that uh, so far from the outbreak, mm. uh, two people have tested negative from the follow-up and they have been discharged from the isolation center. Uh, and we will update that as is appropriate as soon as possible. However, may I also state that of all the people that are now infected in the isolation center, they are all in critical, I mean, they are all in very stable condition. Uh, most of them have no symptoms and a few of them only have mild symptoms. None have moderate to severe symptoms that require critical care management. Therefore, there's no patient in the uh, intensive care unit, no on the ventilators within uh, any of the uh, isolation centers. Okay. Uh, Dr. Salu Ali Kwayabura, Borneo State Commissioner for Health, thank you for coming on Panorama. It's my pleasure. Thank All you. Right. We now take a break. More stories when we return. I wish to once again commend the frontline workers across the country who on a daily basis, risk everything to ensure we win this fight. For those who got infected in the line of duty, rest assured that government will do all it takes to support you and your families during this exceedingly difficult period. I will also take this opportunity to assure you all that your safety, well-being, and welfare remains paramount to our government. I am using this opportunity to express our deepest condolences to the families of all Nigerians that have lost their loved ones as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is our collective loss and we share your grief. Judiciary has for the first time adopted an online court sitting using virtual courtroom to deliver judgment on a pending case of culpable homicide in Medjugorje, the state capital. The state chief judge, Justice Kashim Zanna, monitored the court proceeding online held at different locations when the lockdown was relaxed. The report. This is the first online court sitting in Nigeria by the Borno State High Court No. 13, Meiduguri, featuring virtual courtroom. The significance of adopting a virtual courtroom is not unconnected to the preventive measures against coronavirus pandemic, which led to an extension of court's closure by another two weeks. 
Governor State Judiciary had directed continuation of trial in criminal cases up to judgment to ensure justice is not denied in the face of nationwide lockdown and calls for prison decongestion. Our aim has never been just because of COVID. Even under normal circumstances, the old normal, still there is no need to delay cases because of just simply somebody appearing in the court to open his mouth to talk. That he can do from anywhere in the world. The state chief judge, while monitoring the court sitting online, says more cases will follow suit as this one involving the state versus Ali Muhammad found the accused not guilty of the offense of culpable murder hence was discharged and acquitted by Justice Fadaw Umaru presiding. Now that COVID has brought that reality, we are hopeful that these changes will now come fast and we will show you more that we can do. We can end up making it a rule even that there is, we will not allow just for the sake of coming to talk. We will not even allow anybody to come. You have to do it online. The online or virtual court sitting is made possible using a software application for meetings or teleconferencing redesigned to fit a court proceeding. The Borno State Judiciary says the COVID-19 pandemic has not taken them by surprise as they are fully equipped for the dispensation of justice without delay. In other news, Ramadan fasting is progressing significantly with the Muslim community in Borno observing the holy month in the midst of coronavirus pandemic that led to a total lockdown. Jadwa John Justini in this report sought to find out the situation in Meduguri, the Borno state capital, with the high temperatures, the fear of COVID-19 spreading, and the lockdown affecting the socio-economic well-being of all. Government at all levels directed imposition of lockdown order in almost all states of the Federation to curtail the spread of the coronavirus pandemic. This has distinguished this year's Ramadan from those of previous years as residents are confined to the four corners of their homes. The peak of the heat season has further made conditions in the environment unfavorable for an easy fasting. Already, the COVID-19 lockdown and efforts towards containment of spread has taken its toll on congregational religious worship, Ramadan tafsir and tarawih prayers, in addition to social cultural activities by teenagers in the course of the fasting. NTA camera lens captured residents taking solars under shades in their various neighborhoods with minimum observance of social distancing as directed by experts to avoid the hot weather. Some Muslim faithful who spoke to NTA news narrated their ordeals in this year's Ramadan fast noting of some challenges to include the effect of the lockdown on livelihoods and means of survival, coupled with the unfriendly weather. Borno is one of the hottest states. Compared to other places, this place is not easy to stay indoors. It's very, very, very uh, hard for us to bear it. But some excellence, we are trying our best. To me, there is light at the end of the tunnel. That place is very painful for the citizens to be staying at home in this lockdown and then facing this challenge also. This lockdown have caused a lot of challenge. Like, you know, four people have to go out to make their daily visits. This time around, you know, people have been locked down. They have nowhere to go, you know. And, you know, this is something different from the usual one. They are, however, optimistic that with prayers and adherence to the health tips towards curtailing the spread of the pandemic, there is hope for a new dawn. Muslim faithfuls have been urged to sustain their faith through observing the Ramadan fast in the confines of their homes while adhering to the lockdown order put in place by government to curb the spreading coronavirus pandemic. In Maiduguri, Jetwa John Jesini, NTA News. This is all we can take on Panorama this afternoon. Do have a nice day.